Lovely. Always really exciting when you tell people to greet those around them and it takes a while. Just making sure there's no water to kick over. Hey, if we haven't met already, uh, my name is Lester and I have the awesome privilege of being one of the elders here and one of the pastors here at City Hope Church. And we just want to say from my side again, a massive welcome to everyone that is new and joining us for the very first time. I see some familiar faces, always really epic to see people in church. Um, and then we also have our preteens and our primary school students with us in the room. Come on, it's going to be so much fun to have you. If you're watching online, shout out to YouTube. Hopefully the camera guys will be able to follow me as I move around the this chair. Guys, if you don't know, I have the awesome privilege of preaching quite often at our youth ministry. This is my last preach for 2023. So I'm like super excited. I don't know what's going to happen, but it's going to be good because God is going to be glorified in our midst. Uh, anything can happen if you don't know. I've literally hired a crowd of people to to cheer me down. Like I said, I preach at our youth and young adults, so I love feedback. I strongly believe the church is meant to be a space we can enjoy, have fun together. Is that good, Dan? Yes. <laughs> um, so if you hear anything that you think is good, why not say that is good? If it's in alignment with God's word, why not say preach the text? If you think something is funny, you are more than welcome to laugh. You may even nudge your neighbor and say laugh. Uh, but we're going to have fun today in church. If you don't know, we are currently in a series called Advent. I don't know what you're like, but for me, when I think Advent, um, it was always just the lint chocolate thing, like where you open up a different chocolate every day as you prepare. I see some people laughing with me, so I wasn't the only one. It's just like in preparation, like excited about the day of Christmas. I was always genuinely confused why it stopped on Christmas Eve. I, now I get it. If you're not familiar, Advent is actually us preparing ourselves for Christmas Day, which is the arrival of Jesus. And just like the Advent calendars or whatever it may be, we can get so excited about the thing that we forget to just pause and reflect that the 25th of December is the moment where we reflect the arrival of Jesus. For many years before Jesus arrived, people were waiting with anticipation that the Messiah would come one day. And we get to live on the other side that he has come. What a beautiful thing. And I think it's so within our nature and our culture just to pass something like that by and just be like, oh, it's another day. I know we can make much of many things, but the arrival of Jesus, I think is something we can pause and just be in awe again. And just be like, God, you're so good to us. Um, all my city crew people, you will have a notebook, your little brown packet, there's uh, a notepad in there uh, for you to follow along as I am preaching, just because uh, we believe in taking notes. So to all my older people, why not take notes? We just believe that it's, um, it's a good thing to reflect on God's word. Um, I say this all the time and someone comes up and be like, that's exactly where I was. Uh, in moments like this, we're still thinking about what happened at work during the week. Like, and what's to come? Or even right now, we might be sitting here thinking about Sunday lunch or what are we doing? Oh, I'm there with you, Sunday lunch. But it's so like God wants to meet with us, speak to us, but our minds can be so distant to what or out of sight of the room right now. So I believe when we take notes, we just get to refocus again. And not only do we hear it once, but we get to meditate on it again. So if you have a phone, why not take notes on your phone? You have a notebook, uh, that's cool too. Maybe let's try to save the environment, but it's cool. Whatever works for you, take notes. Our series title is A Seat at the Table. And it's the idea that we're looking at the nativity scene and we're just looking at everyone's approach to the moment of Jesus' arrival. Last week, James kicked us off and he looked at the life of Joseph and him preparing himself for Jesus' arrival. Today, I have the awesome privilege of looking at his betrothed. Mary. Um, but before I jump into the text, I, I just want to give us a bit of a background just so that we're all on the same page. But can I, with everyone just pausing for a moment, looking at me, can I ask us? I know James did this last week, but I had a similar encounter with my little boy. If you don't know, this is my amazing, beautiful, incredibly gifted wife. Uh, brownie points all the way around. No, it's just because generally I say one thing, she's like, 
not more. Uh, so that's my wife. We have a little boy. His name is Jethro. He's two years old. And this year we had the awesome privilege of taking him down to Cape Town. I mean, Durban, sorry. And I was really excited about him seeing the sea for the first time. I was like, boy, you're going to love it. It's going to be amazing. Um, as we brought him to the ocean, he kind of saw the waves and went, I don't like that. And he just ran away because he was like, that's intimidating. And it just kind of, the thought struck me. Sometimes when we see something over and over again, we sometimes lose the awe awareness of it, the wonder of it, and it just becomes another thing that we see. Can I encourage us, when we come to the story specifically of Christmas and also Easter, we almost come with the lens of like, I know where we're going with this. But can I encourage us today to look at this account with fresh perspective, fresh wonder, that God can reveal something new about himself again today. Because here's what we believe about the Bible. It's not just another good book, but it's living and active. That God can reveal something new about himself today to us if we would remove all distraction and just say god here i am speak to me so for my primary school and city crew people uh, we do this every week the bible is god's word we believe that it's a collection of 66 books divided up into two parts the old testament and the new old testament and the new testament Old Testament has 39 books. The New Testament has 27 books. We believe that it is written by different authors, but ultimately penned or penned by different authors, by written by God through His Spirit. So it's all from different vantage points, but communicating the same thing, that we as God's people need a Savior, and He came in the form of a baby and died on the cross for us. We currently have 2,000 500 different Bible translations. Uh, <laughs> that's crazy. Uh, people often ask me, what is the best Bible translation? This is just my personal conviction. It's the one you read. Um, it doesn't help having uh, a Bible that's in Greek or Hebrew and it just sits on your shelf collecting dust. God's Word is meant to change us. We are supposed to reflect God's Word. So the best version of the Bible is the one that you read. Um, we're going to be jumping into Luke's Gospel. Luke uh, is commissioned by a man called Theophilus. Theophilus is a very affluent person, and he hears about the claims and the teachings of Jesus. And he's on the precipice of believing and trusting in this guy named Jesus. But before he can do so, he commissions Luke, who's a doctor, to go and do some investigation into the claims. Oh, shut up, bro. Come on. So, and the, can we give a round of applause for Dan? Um, in the morning gathering, he made me die, and then he just like slowly walked with the water bottle. Uh, but shout out, bro. I'm going to have a sip just now. Um, <coughs> maybe just now. Um, so, Luke is commissioned to do this. Luke, the way he would have gone about his business is he would have gone to Nazareth and actually sat down with Mary and interviewed her because that was the culture of the time to get eyewitness accounts. So Luke is hearing this firsthand and is writing it down, recording it for Theophilus and also for our good. We'll see in the story, we find an angel named Gabriel. Uh, so the one thing I do want to pause and make sure I explain really well is, within scripture we see that angels are real. We don't believe in angels as in a form of faith, but we understand that they are messengers sent by God to accomplish His work. So we believe they're real because the Bible says that they're real. Within Scripture, there's only two angels ever mentioned. And it's Gabriel and Michael. And on this particular account, we've got the angel Gabriel. And I just want to pause and like, this is a big deal that the angel of the Lord is sent down. And where's this angel sent to? The angel is sent to Nazareth. Now, I know, again, like I said, we, we want to come with fresh perspective in the context of when the scripture was written. When we think Nazareth, we think this is a, a big place. It's very popular now. Many people are going there to visit where Jesus was. But in the context of when the scripture was written, Nazareth was no bigger than 100 people. It was considered to be a rural town where uneducated people often reside. It was positioned between two major cities. So as people were making their way to the different cities, they would go to Nazareth just to have a quick toilet break, fuel up, and continue their journey on to the next city. Uh, when I think of Nazareth, I think of Colesburg. 
You know, like when you go from the Western Cape, I mean, from Joburg to the Western Cape, you go through Colesburg. It's just a good place to like get refreshed and move on. Is there anyone from Colesburg? Cool, beautiful. So we all can relate to Colesburg just being that place. Like, you don't go visit Colesburg, you pass through Colesburg. It was the same for Nazareth. No one actually stayed there. You just passed through as you were making your journey further. So it was a no-name, unpopular area. But this is where the angel of the Lord is sent. Also in the story, we'll, or in this account, apologies, in this account, we'll also see a man named Joseph. Joseph was betrothed to Mary. James did a great job of speaking about Joseph last week, so I'm just going to give us a quick snapshot. If you weren't here last week, why not go on our YouTube page and watch that? But Joseph was a carpenter by trade. We know that from studies uh, that Joseph was most likely between the age of 14 and 16 years old. He was also from Nazareth. He was a, in the line, bloodline of the King, King David. So he had a royal descent. But we see that he was extremely poor. And you might be asking, how do we know that he was poor? We actually see this later on in Luke's Gospel. We see that Jesus, Mary, and Joseph go to the temple to offer up sacrifice. But it says that they were not able to, so they had to go per the Old Testament law, which meant that they couldn't offer a bull or a ram, so they offered up pigeons. And that was something reserved for people who didn't have money, but God still wanted them to offer up a sacrifice. So we see them offering up pigeons, indicating that they weren't wealthy. So here's the angel of God, Gabriel, sent to a no-name town, Nazareth, to a young boy named Joseph, as we learned last week. And now we're going to see his encounter with someone else, and her name is Mary. Uh, if you're not sure where we are, we are in Luke's Gospel, chapter 1. Uh, we're going to read from verse 26 to verse 38. I'm going to say it one more time, because it's part of the answer sheet for our city crew, guys. We are in Luke 1, verse 26 to 38. Lovely. It says, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city, the city of Galilee, named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And, she, and he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. This is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Can I read it again? Is that cool with you guys? For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be according to your word. And the angel departed from him. Let's pray together one more time. Father God, we just thank you so much for your word. Thank you, God, that it is not just another novel thank you god that is sharper than two any edged sword and god i pray right now that we as your people would grow in our understanding of who you are holy spirit won't you speak to us afresh god i pray that we would not leave the same way we came in but god we would have met with you we would have done business with you and god our lives will forever be changed god you're so good I pray these things in your precious name and all god's people said Come on. That's a good amen right there. 
Come on. Um, so we all know, as you know, the, the, the series is called At the Table. I, I don't know what it's like in your household over the Christmas festive time, uh, but my wife and I have had it a few times where we've hosted people over the Christmas time. And the thing I love about preparing for guests is when you have the unrational conversation with yourself about everything that needs to be cleaned. Like cleaning under your bed is not necessary for guests. No one is going to go into your room and lift up your bed and like drag their finger and be like, this is a dirty household. We clean everything. My parents were here in the morning gathering. In the middle of winter, my dad would make me clean the swimming pool. I'm like, it, no one's swimming. It's just, it doesn't make sense. Um, but I think I love about Christmas is, I don't know if you've had that experience where you buy a Christmas gift for someone and you've like agonized over it. Like you've given it great thought. Like you think you know them to a T. And like the excitement of like giving them their gift. And I like just like, you like want to jump out of your skin because you're like, Oof, you knew. what I Like have you ever had around, been around those people that like, they get you a gift and they keep like dropping hints the whole time. If you knew what I got you, you change your gift. Oh, I got you something you're really going to love. And then it just builds like this like anticipation inside of you and then you get the gift and you unwrap the gift and it's just not what you expected at all. And now you're like in that awkward position of like, how do I handle myself now? Like, now you're like, it's so great. Like, uh, it's just not what I expected at all. If you're taking notes, my point number one is this. The person God uses is the unexpected person. When we think of someone who should be the mother of Jesus. For, I'm sure for many of us, we're thinking it needs to be someone of royal decree. It needs to be someone, like even when we think about Mary, we oftentimes see the portraits and it's like Mary with like this beautiful flowing, elegant like robe. She's usually got like either a halo behind her, like she walk everywhere with a halo where she's got like a crown a beautiful jewels all around and she always looks like quite old in the pictures like well in age like 30s on yeah <laughs> cool um but she always looks like someone that you're like cool that looks like someone that should be the mother of jesus but can i encourage you that when we look at the context of the time we know that mary was betrothed to joseph Oftentimes, people that were betrothed were usually betrothed at the age of 12 years old. So we can deduce that Mary was 12 years old when the angel of the Lord appeared to her. Now, we have some 12-year-olds in the room, or you might have some family members that are 12 years old. When someone is 12 years old, we don't trust them to drive. Like, we don't give much responsibility to a 12-year-old. And yet, that is the very person that God says you're going to be the one to carry Jesus. Acne and braces and all, you're, you're the one. You're the one that has found favor with God. Now, if you don't know, if for context, because uh, Nazareth was a rural town that people passed through, we can deduce again that Mary was uneducated. Not only was Mary, but most of the men in the town, most of the women, would have been uneducated. Meaning they couldn't write, they couldn't read. Mary's... Um, what she understood from scripture would have been memorized from what was opened on the synagogues and what was shared with her. So she wasn't someone that could just quickly turn to scripture, remind herself of what God was going to do. She couldn't understand it. One of the things we actually see is Mary, if you look at uh, later on in Luke's gospel, she was a phenomenal singer. She actually writes a song in the gospel of Luke. And all from just declaring God's goodness and faithfulness over her life. Here's someone that was... Her all, like, I don't know what comes to mind for you when you think of someone, please again, with new fresh awe and wonder, who will birth the Savior of the world. Would you think of someone that is uneducated? Most of the portraits have her sitting on a throne. She was probably sitting on a wooden, like, stool, where she was crowned with the most luxury, like, in the pictures, always like a beautiful gown. She probably had, like, not that great clothing. Where she's sitting in a position of power, she was actually a girl that walked around with dirty feet, walking around town, collecting wood for a family so they could sit around the fire. That is not my ideal of like who I think will be 
the Savior's mother. But isn't that so true and so beautiful of the Christian faith? That when we think about it, if we were to say that this was the man-made faith, we wouldn't choose that as the mother of our Savior. We would go to the palace. We would go to an affluent family. We would make sure that Jesus had the best of the best of the best because he's the Savior of the world. Yet God saw it fit that he would be born to Mary in a town like Nazareth. Nathaniel, one of Jesus' disciples, will get approached to come see Jesus, and he'll say these famous words, Can anything good come from Nazareth? That's how intense it was. Now for us, it just seems like, but that is the condition of what was happening. Not the most likely candidate, but how true is it so many times when it comes to the things of God that he always chooses the most unlikely people to fulfill his purposes. Point number two. Are you guys still with me? Beautiful. Point number two is this. Graced by God. Graced by God. We're going to read, jump back into the scripture again. It says this. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the same. Try to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid. Angel in front of you, don't be afraid. Mary, you have found favor with God. Now, again, culturally, we need to understand that part of Mary's fear is firstly, Gabriel was an angel. But in Gabriel being an angel, he would have been in the form of a man. And culturally, women, or at least young girls like Mary, would not be in a closed private space with a man. So her fear was also written in, what we're doing right now is not okay. But I love what um, the angel says to her. He says, you have found favor with God. Now for us to understand, when Mary hears that she will be the mother of the Savior, we much, like it is a shocking statement, but not so much when we look at Isaiah 7 verse 14, which Mary would have heard recited often that this, the Savior would be born to a virgin and they will call him Emmanuel. So Mary would have heard this verse opened up, recited. So she was well aware that the Savior of the world would be born to a virgin. But in this moment, in all of time, in all of history, God saw it fit in that exact moment to choose Mary. Man, I don't know what it does to you, but it blows my mind. God is both in and outside of time. Yet knowing who Mary would be, how Mary would respond, he chose a 14 year I mean 12 year old girl and was faithful to her as she trusted him. And God says to her, or the angel says to her, You have found favor. Now the thing we need to know about the word favor is it tie, it's strongly connected to the word grace. And what is grace? Undeserved favor, unending, unmerited love. In that moment, what the angel was saying to Mary is, God has chosen you and God has graced you. I hope as I'm getting excited, you can hear that there's nothing that qualified Mary to receive this favor, this grace and this love. Isn't that so true of us as well? That we do nothing to receive God's love, His grace, or His favor. This is why, in particular, we at City Hope Church, we don't believe in religion. Because religion speaks about this idea that I will do these things, and in doing these things, I tick boxes, and then I will receive God's favor. Then I will receive God's love. But as modeled through Mary, we do nothing to deserve God's favor. On your best days, you will not measure up, but that is God's grace towards you. Can I say that again? Because I think many of us, again, we've heard this. I know I've heard it, but yet we still find ourselves in practical moments thinking, I'm trusting God for this, so I know if I do this, one plus one equals two, so God will find favor with me. I'll find favor with God. For even the mature in the room, I argue that we all do it. Both intentionally or subconsciously, we do it. We 
We're going on a fast. We're trusting God for breakthrough in a particular area. But then we start to act out in a way that makes us stand right, green, right standing with God, so that we can get His favor. But can I just bring the notion to you again that there's nothing you can do. There's no one thing that you can add to you, God's grace to your life. It's undeserved favor, unmerited love. I even just love the way uh, in the scriptures it reveals that God first loved us, that God first graced us, that all we do is respond and love Him back. Even in that, all we do is love the one who loved us as a response. Like, it blows my mind how good God is to us as people. That the one who has offended, the one who, when we sin, sin isn't the bad things, we, sin is, is missing the mark. Sin is an offense towards God. The one who is offended is, is the one who extends his grace. I, it just, it, it blows my mind because I think we've come so, so comfortable at hearing it that I don't think we're in awe of it anymore that, that one who had nothing, did nothing wrong is the one who shows us grace. I, if you don't know, I have a little boy uh, I mentioned. He's at the age now where he th throws things. You know, he's just, he throws. Um, someone told us, but he's just exploring. No, he throws. So he, he throws things and I'm like, boy, you have to go say sorry. He's like, no. And then when you do something, it's like, say sorry to me. And I'm like, this, this is not how it works. I didn't hurt you, but, but you, you require a sorry. And that's so true of us as people. We want to be apologized to. When we are offended, you need to say sorry. Yet God, whose sin is the offense against, is the one who says, I'll send my son to be the sacrifice so that you can be restored back into a relationship with me. The one who did nothing wrong. That is God's grace to us. I pray that that never becomes something that we can hear preached on a Sunday or mention and we go, oh yeah, I know that. But it would always just bring us in a moment of awe and wonder that that is the God we serve. Now to find where he is in our hearts. Let's go to point number three. Point number three is this. God of the impossible. God of the impossible. So, God, Jesus, oh, God speaks to, through the angel to Mary. You will have a child. Um, then Mary kind of asks God or asks the angel, how will this be? And in the context of what Mary responds, I just want to take us back to earlier in Luke chapter 1. Earlier in Luke chapter 1, we find a priest named Zechariah. Zechariah is married to a woman named Elizabeth. As you see in the text, Elizabeth is Mary's cousin. Zechariah is very old. As the scripture says, and his wife is also very old. They've been trusting God for a child. Up until this point, uh, Elizabeth has been barren. Uh, Zechariah, as a priest, goes into the temple to do the sacrificial offering. While doing so, an angel appears to him. Take a wild guess who the angel was. Uh, the angel Gabriel appears to him as well and says that you will have a child. Your wife is old, but she will have a child. And then... Zacharias says, how will this be? Some of the translation says, what will be the sign of this? Now what happens to Zechariah in a moment saying, what will be the sign of this? The angel says, you do not believe. And as a result, Zechariah could not speak for the rest of the duration of Elizabeth's pregnancy. The angel made him mute because he did not believe. But we might read the scripture and be like, that kind of seems very similar to Mary's question. Why did one turn into mute and why was the other one i'm a slave and she carried on well in terms of uh, zachariah's response when he said what will be the sign of this what he was saying was just symptomatic of what he believed in his heart and what he believed in his heart was this he doubted god's ability to do it he believed that god was limited because elizabeth was old and god could not do it can I remind us again that Zechariah was a priest. He opened up God's law. He would have seen stories like or accounts like Sarah and Abraham who also couldn't have children well into their old age and God says to them, is anything impossible for me? The doubt in whether God could do it was the result of why Zechariah was made. When it comes to Mary, 
Mary believed that God could do it. She was more concerned about the logistics of how it would happen. Can I say this very well? That doubt is what we're trying to avoid, but having questions is not a bad thing. I believe that God uh, is God. I believe He sent His Son. I believe that Jesus rose from the grave. I believe I will spend eternity with Him. But on earth, I've just got some questions, some things I'm wrestling with, some things I just don't quite understand yet. Can I encourage you in the book of Isaiah, God says to Isaiah, come now, let us reason together. God is bigger than your questions. God is not intimidated by your questions. But let's not mistake questioning for doubting. There's nothing wrong with saying, I still got some questions. But if you doubt God's ability or what he's capable of doing, we want to move away from that. Uh, earlier, there's an old church father leader that said this, that see, faith is seeking understanding. That in our faith, having questions is us saying we believe, but we just want to have understanding. But can I add to that notion that we do need to come to terms that that fact that we are finite and God is an infinite God, that our knowledge is limited, and God knows all things, so the more you know, the more you don't. You realize you don't know. Whenever you think you've got an understanding of who God is, this is another complexity of the richness of who He is that you just haven't unlocked yet. But don't run away from the questions, but I do kind of put you at ease. To ever say, I understand God, I might argue with you that you don't understand Him. Because He can't be understood. And that's the beauty of being in relationship with Him. Because He does reveal more of who He is. But there's never more we can say, I've got Christianity, this Christian walk done, nailed. No, we're continuing learning, understanding. God is revealing more of who He is. So there Mary is. Angel says, she says, how, is this, how will this be? What are the logistics? But she says next, she's like, but I am a servant of the Lord. The, the verse uses handmaiden. It was the lowest form of servant. And Mary was saying, Whatever God needs of me, I will do it. Whatever it costs, I'm in. Mary had a question, but she also had simple faith to just believe the angel that spoke on God's behalf. If God said it, I'm doing it. What I find interesting is, like I mentioned, Mary was uneducated. She had a little bit of the, the scriptures. But what the little that Mary had, she believed it fully. We have the entirety of the Bible, and yet we struggle to believe all that we have. We have so much collecting dust on our shelves. Mary had the little, and she held on to that little, and was counted to as faith. And we have so much. There's a plethora of resources, and yet we still doubt. What would it look like if we simply believed the way Mary believed? Martin Luther said this, the greatest miracle is this, faith. That we would just believe in God. We would just take Him at His word. That we would fully believe that if God says that it's possible with Him, that it is possible. And this is the position Mary finds herself in. And I want you to know this, that when Mary says yes to Jesus, or yes to God in this moment. She is believing that He can do the impossible. She is believing that what was once barren with Elizabeth, now there's a baby. That a virgin can conceive a child. That God can take that which is dead and make it alive. That He can split the sea so His people can walk on dry land. Not once, not twice, but He can do it a few times. That walls can come crumbling down. That four men can go into, three men can go into a fire. Nothing will happen to them. Daniel can chill in the lions. Then nothing will happen to them. Why? Because God is the God of the impossible. The people who are dead in their sin can become alive because of what Jesus can do. When Mary says yes to the call that God places on her life, I know that we might just be sitting and we're like, okay, cool. Like, she said yes to um, giving birth to the Savior of the world. That's kind of cool. But culturally, can I unpack that there were a lot of ramifications to the decision she just made. We know that she had been betrothed to Joseph for a year. For the last year, that's a long waiting like, 
wedding prep. Like she's been thinking about her wedding day. The moment that she would celebrate with friends and family as her and Joseph come together as husband and wife. In that moment, what she was saying is, I'm willing to forego my betrothal to Joseph. Because everyone in the town would see that she is pregnant and the betrothal process has not ended. So that means that she has been unfaithful to Joseph. And Joseph could divorce her because it had to be that intense. It wasn't just, oh, we're going to call off our betrothal. It was a divorce process. And what they would do to Mary is they would strip her off the clothes that she was wearing, put on other clothes, filthier rags, put her in the town center, throw verbal abuse at her, physically abuse her as an example to all the women that this woman has been unfaithful to her husband by saying yes to I will I trust you God and I will carry the savior of the world she was saying I count the cost that this might happen to me what would happen to her is her reputation would fully be destroyed her marriage to Joseph fully gone people would come I don't know if you ever thought about this, but the fact that everyone in town would have known that Jesus was not just Joseph's son. So the children and people would have probably gone around saying nasty things about who Mary was and what she had done. She was willing to forego all that because she saw, God, if you're calling me to this, I'm willing to forego all this because you are greater than all these things. And I just wondered today for some of us, We've written the script of our lives. For some of us, it's marriage, children, reputation. If God would in, like, inject himself into that and rewrite the script of our life, would he still be God and would he still be good for us? Or would it be, God, you are evil, God, you are against me? Because what Mary saw is, God, you are good regardless, and you are the prize that I'm trying to get to. All these things are secondary. And maybe, just maybe, we've created idols out of these things and not allowed God to be positioned in the position of authority over our lives. That actually God plus nothing, just God alone. Mary is willing to let go of all of this, sacrifice, lay down her life in obedience to the Father. What I love about this, and I didn't say it in the earlier gathering, is how cool God's beauty is. This is a beautiful foreshadowing of what Jesus would do in the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus would before going to the cross would pray and say father if this is not your will remove this cup we see that God does not remove the cup and Jesus publicly embarrassed beaten mocked on our behalf but gladly fixes his eyes on the father and accomplishes and runs his race for God's glory I love how Mary shows us that, Jesus shows us, and I just think scripture is always pointing us to be Christian, little Jesus, be like me. God is calling us to lay down our reputation, lay down the things that we might hold as more valuable than Him. Jesus goes to the cross, I want to unpack that a little bit more, beaten, mocked, scorned, an innocent man hung on a tree so that we who don't deserve God's grace could receive it doing nothing but responding in his name and asking for forgiveness. Now, as we unpack the story of Mary, there's two things. We can either be on the camp that makes too much of Mary, or we can be on the other side that speaks too little of her. And the too much side is we can start to think that Mary is co-redeemer. Jesus says, no one comes to the Father but through me. Mary does not save us. Mary is an example of faith, but not the object of our faith. Mary too, we can see in the book of Acts, is Jesus is now risen and she's celebrating and praising her son and what he is going to, has accomplished over sin. I think if we were to get to heaven one day, we'd find Mary sitting there like, look to my son. It's never been about me. Not once. Um, there's some, some scholars and some people teach that Mary was forever a virgin. We know that after the appropriate time of Jesus being born, we see that Mary and Joseph go on to have children. 
Mary was a virgin in Jesus' conception, but post that she also had children. That's the side we make too much of her. Mary had sin. That's why we find her at the temple offering sacrifice. She was with sin. How could someone who is sinful redeem us? There's only one who was without sin, without blemish, who was able to redeem us and restore us back to the Father. But on the other side, we can just make too little of Mary. We cannot speak of her. We just read the verse and we move on. But Mary is a great example, as many other people in the Scripture, of trusting and holding on to God, taking Him at His word. So we want to be just like Mary. For my young people in the room, my city crew and high school students, what a great example of not serving God one day when we're older. Here's a 12-year-old girl, I know some of you fall in that age group, who said, whatever the cost, God, I'm living my life for you. Not culture that says it's all about me, me, me. But actually, God, it's whatever you have for my life, I'm trusting you. This is a great example for us. I know sometimes in Scripture we can look at all the people like, one day when I'm older, Jesus, you know, I'll get to that. But here's someone who for the rest of her life, starting at the age of 12, was found to be in the presence obeying the will of the Father. Let's not have the, I'm not that there's anything wrong, but what would it look if we also had the, a story like that, of saying, I met Jesus when I was young, and I trusted Him every day of my life. So, what are some applicational points for us as I wrap up? That's just, just cue for keep listening i'm almost done but we're still far but everyone's still good right there we go application point number one there's a price to pay in following jesus for my city crew primary school with great power comes great responsibility as the famous words of ben parker peter parker's uncle i think when it comes to following jesus and submitting our lives to him I think many of us are willing to submit to God or give our lives to God as an antidote for the hurt and the pain I'm feeling. Not because God is good and worthy of me giving my life to Him. For many of us, Christianity has just become this warm comfort blanket just to make me feel, I just need a hug, I just need to be encouraged. Please don't hear what I'm not saying. There's a time and a place for that. But when it comes to what God is, it's we need to count the cost. There's no particular verse in Scripture where I can find you that says, when you put your faith in Jesus, everything's going to be great. Everything's going to go your way. Streets of gold are in heaven alone. It doesn't mean when you put your faith in Jesus, everything's going to go your way. Traffic is not going to get better. Your boss is not going to change. But what we do see changing is the fact that in the midst of the storm, in the midst of the waves and the challenges of life, we are placing our feet in a firm foundation. That when the winds come, we won't bend because we are placed and found to be in the presence of our Father. Christianity doesn't, did, God never said it's going to be easy, but He said He'll be with us. But we need to count the cost. Mary showed from her life that she saw the cost what she was going to lose but her eyes were fixed on the father if you lost everything would your eyes still be fixed on the father the next thing is we need to get eternity in view for many of us we we are so happy myself included to forgo the long term for the short term eternity is a long time but we want instant pleasure we want instant gratification right now it makes me think of gym because we all love going to gym but gym is one of those things where you go tomorrow you're not going to see results the next day you're not going to see you're not going to see results in four weeks six twelve nothing six months maybe close friends and family will say we see a difference but it's a long process and here's the thing that always gets me about gym eating healthy healthy lifestyle it's not something your body will thank you for now but in the future what the sacrifices you make right now we might not appreciate now but in view of eternity it will be so much beautiful but where are your eyes fixed where are your eyes fixed it's fixed on the temporary the here the right now or is eternity in the 8 a.m gathering i was speaking to a young girl she was like i want to have my eyes fixed on eternity so how do i take my school how do i lead my friends to jesus i'm like well firstly that's a great start to say, God, here I am, 
use me. And why I mentioned that example is because I think we can so easily again be like, that is just for those people, but for all of us to get eternity in view. That one day Mary knows where she'll be, as in the presence of the Father. How cool would it be one day for us to be there, but to know that we brought so many along with us, that yes, we might lose in the here right now, but we gain so much in eternity with Him. The third one is God always keeps His promises. God can do the impossible. And I know this can be hype right now. This could be a little bit like, let's go. But I think there is a moment for us to just pause and be like, that doctor's report that you got, God can do the impossible. What's happening in your family right now, God can do the impossible. What is barren, God can do the impossible. That we need to hold on to the fact that our God, as we sung, is a miracle maker, a way maker. The light in the dark place, God can move and do what we can't do. I don't think that's like a hype thing. That's a security thing. It's like, that's my God. When no one else can, He can. Where it seems like it's lost, there's still hope because I believe in my living hope, which is Jesus. I want you to believe today that God can still do the impossible and to hold Him at His word. So whatever it is that you're trusting Him for, continue to trust him but to also say one of the greatest things that god did that was impossible was the fact that he went to the cross and died on our behalf sacrificed his son for us it's the greatest gift we could get greatest miracle what was impossible for us to do was possible for god to do for his son the last thing is this and it's a question to think have you submitted to God like me? And two sides to this. Have you submitted your life as in, I'm trusting you, God, as my Lord and Savior. That I've, I've never believed in you before. I've been around church. I've got some Christian friends. But today I find myself in this place. This is the season to be in church. I'm in church. I'm hearing what you did on the cross. And God, I'm willing to submit my life to your grace and your favor. Or maybe you're on the other side where maybe you made that decision a while back. But if we're honest, it was just a decision. But it wasn't a lifestyle that was fully submitted to the Father. Can I encourage you today? Let's not leave, as I prayed earlier, let's not leave the same way we can. Let's just say, God, I lay it all at your feet. God, I trust you and I'm holding on to you. Uh, my boy Jethro, we bring him to church sometimes, just because he like gets like overwhelmed by how many people there is. Uh, he'll come and he sees all the faces, and immediately he'll just like beeline straight for me because I'm his favorite. Um, he'll run to me and he like jumps into my arms and like wraps his head and like buries his head into my chest, and I'll just feel his heartbeat go from like crazy because he was like really scared, and it'll just kind of slow down, and he's like becomes more chill. And then he's like happy to just look around and greet everyone. And I try to put him down. He's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Up, up, up. Like, I'm fine, but hold me. And I want you to know that when you submit your life fully to God, He's the one that holds us. He's the one that won't let you down. It's a life that says, God, I'm holding on to you because I can't. You're the God of the impossible. You're the God I'm trusting. But God, I can't do it on my own. So I'm leaving it at the cross. I'm leaving it at your feet. And God, for dear life, I'm holding on to you. It seems like defeated, but that is surrender. And the safest place you can be is in the presence of your loving Father. I'm going to ask you to stand with me for a second. I'd love for you to close your eyes. If you'd be so kind. I do feel very strongly about those particular groups of people. And I'd really like to take this moment just to, to pray for people that are in that space. If you're in the room tonight and you're saying, you know what, I've never submitted my life to God. I've never put my faith in Him. I've been around church. I've seen church things. I've experienced and I've heard of His goodness. But I've never said or invited him and said, God, here I am. I want to live my life for you. If you're in the room today and you're saying, God, here I am. God, I want to live my life 
for you. God, I believe what you did on the cross for me. God, I know you did what was impossible for me to do. You did it on my behalf. And God, today I want to submit my life to you as my loving Father. If that's you in the room. I'm going to ask everyone to close their eyes. This is a sign of privacy. If that's you in the room, would you mind putting up your hand? Because I'd love to pray for you. Don't worry, nice and high. No one else can see you. I see some hands. It's not a moment I'm going to rush by, not for any other thing, but just it's the most epic decision you could make in your life. To say, God, here I am. I give my life to you. God, I can't, but you can. So, Father God, I, I, the scripture, the Bible says this, that if we would believe in our hearts and confess with our lips that Jesus is the Lord, that we'll be saved. So I want you, I'm going to pray for you right now. But for the people that have put their hands up, I just want you to simply do this. Say, God, I'm sorry for spaces and areas where I've made it about me, if I've missed them. But God, I believe that you died on the cross. You sent your son to die on the cross for me. He rose from the grave, showing that sin and death has no power over him. And God, I submit my life to you. God, I pray for those people that have their hands lifted up right now. People who are saying, God, I can't, but thank you, God, that you did. Thank you, Jesus, that we could not save ourselves. But thank you that you sent your son. You willingly went down, laid your life, saying that sin and death has no power over you, and that you rose in victory. So God, as we surrender our lives to you, we rise in the victory that you have. Thank you, God, for every hand that is lifted up, represents a heart of someone you love, you care for, and you came to save. God, I pray right now for those people that have their hands up, that you'd wash them with your love, overcome every, any doubt, full surrender to our living King. God, you're so good. Pray this is in your precious name. Amen. You guys can put your hands down. I pray for the next group of people. As I've been preaching, one of my sisters, she calls it a conviction warning, a CW. Where just as God's word has been preached, there's been a moment where as I was speaking about things that have not been fully submitted to God, where maybe for some of us today, you're still holding on to things and God's saying, it's time. Today is the day. Might not even be a word I said, but it's just something God's been challenging you throughout the weekend. You're still holding on. Maybe finance. Maybe a sickness. Maybe something. You're still holding on. And God's saying, would you release your grip and surrender it over to me? And almost move back and watch what I will do. For your good and for my glory. If there's any people in the room today, she's saying, man, God, here I am. I need to let go of some stuff. Would you mind putting your hand up? Because I'd love to pray for you as well. Awesome. Father God, I, I pray for those people who have their hands up right now. Father God, I'm so always struck by how intimate you are to your children and to those you love. That God, you know exactly everything that each one of these people are facing. The area where they're just struggling to release and surrender. God, I pray even now for some, through still quietly dripped hands, God, that you would, they would just release today. That they would just surrender. That God, what feels like defeat in a moment would actually be true victory. Because in releasing you, releasing that thing, we can hold on to you. So God, I just pray right now. Won't you, through the grace of your spirit, spirit, won't you change remind our, remind our hearts of flesh of your goodness, your faithfulness, that we let go of that thing. Fully let go. As we drive out the building today, God, knowing that you will handle it. But we can't, God, I pray again, that we would know that you can. Because you are good, and you are for us, and you are the God of the impossible. God, we love you. We pray these things in your precious name. And all God's people said. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to firstly just to pause and say, man, so awesome. Can we celebrate together that some people have put their faith in Jesus today. Just really cool. And what we're going to do to end off in this is we're going to sing and turn our attention again to the cross. Are we going to sing together of what He's done? 
and His faithfulness and His goodness towards us. Can I encourage us? Let's sing in a posture of victory to our great and wonderful God who deserves all our praise. Let's sing together.